So I'm here in Cubo Tactical's workshop. I got a lot of cool stuff in my shop, but I have zero bowling pins, and he's got a bunch. <laughs> so here's a shit book where Roger will be talking a little about CNC, about some software and some mold making stuff. Here's Roger, the man, and uh, Mojo. 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 What's up, man? Robin. Batman and Robin are here. So we've been talking about uh, Roger's fabric lamination process, which is totally sweet. We were playing with my new AR mag carriers, talking about green orientation on Kydex looking at this drill bit that needs a little bit of TLC because it gets uh, cleaned once a year. And this really cool DIY strip heater, he got out the back, a lot of MDF, crank it up, making my camera phone hot. See that action there? Yeah. And uh, a variation on the Iron Wolf press, the old scissor jack with the ratchet, making cool stuff with foam. Which, which foam do you use, Roger? Uh, indexes. Indexes foam. Ooh. Classic. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I haven't used so much. I have used foam in so long. You got the classic coffee bum press, the t-shirt press, a lot of the basic tools you guys are all real familiar with. Probably most small shops don't have a router. Um, some of Roger's stuff is here. This is a, you know, a test mag carrier mold. There was another one around. with the second one go? That was the Gen One first try. Here's try two, a little more blocking, some more angles, some dimpling for drilling. It's got some vacuum through holes. This is all MDF, which is gross. I hate MDF, but you know, <laughs> it's cheap and it's available. Roger's got tons of scraps, so he's working with it. And uh, now I've got you on Facebook Live, Roger. What questions do you have? Um, what's everybody else out there seeing volume-wise? Like as far as what are you getting orders per week? Ooh, the numbers questions. For a shop like this, because I'm sure a lot of us are same thing, three car garage setup. Uh, this week we did, I think, 36 orders so far this week, but it's also because of SHOT Show and everybody goes nuts during SHOT Show. So SHOT Show volume sales go up? Every year. That's awesome. Do you do any in-person sales in Vegas during SHOT Show? Do you have extra inventory in hand and like sell out of a trench coat? Like, hey kid, you want to buy a holster? <laughs> we don't do anything in stock, but pretty much anything you see right there and the stuff over here, like this stuff's going to get shipped out. That's but, a, what you just said is something I want to change. What did you just say, Roger? You said we don't do anything in stock. Oh, yeah. I'd love to see <laughs> that change. We were talking about the quality, uh, the quality issue, and I was also admiring this really cool, hard felt buffing wheel he's got, which I have not played with anything like this in a long, long time. He uses it for his fabric laminated holsters, which look pretty sweet. There was one that had, uh, yeah, cryptic light bearing with the red. Super clean. I don't do anything like this. I've never done a fabric coated holster, uh, but dude, it's good looking. And it's got that nice click. But we were talking about his edge finishing process to get those nice clean lines without delaminating the uh, material, without getting fraying, because that seems to be a big thing that makes a difference between guys who are doing it so-so and guys who are doing it real well. Black multicam, right? Black multicam, we're getting a live buffing demo. Here's your edge, that's from the bandsaw. Bandsaw edge, focus on that. Come on. Bandsaw edge, you can see it's rough. It's gonna go ahead and polish it for so, us. All we'll do, take a look at the Look at that wrist technique. Just to clean up those lines, and then it's just hard to fill. Asking how you get that fabric to melt in the oh, clean line. Oh, that smell. <laughs> oh, breathe it in. I haven't breathed that smell in days. No, That's it. it's just that easy. You too can be a holster maker. Some of you can. Everybody keeps asking. That is one question we get on the, uh, the Facebook group a lot is how do you get the edges done on the fabric? That's it. That hard felt. That's belt. it. That was all. Hey, John Hopman. Filster is watching the live oh, feed shit. from your shop. Life. Woo! Winning at life now. Goals. Um, what else were we talking about? Oh, yeah, so on the quality issue, what quality should you keep? Only that which matters. Only that which matters. What do you do with all the other quality that doesn't matter to the end user? You ship it out because shipping beats perfection. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> so, talking about what quality is and what it means, and I was realizing that early on in my holster company, I was really obsessed with like glossy edges and everything beautiful, like everything just the way I wanted it. And I realized that I was actually hurting my customers by, being, by forcing myself to charge them more money because I was taking way more time and also making them wait longer to get the product because I was more concerned about 
getting my personal satisfaction out of the holster mm -hmm. than I was concerned about getting them a very good, perfectly functional, like 98% cool, cosmetically clean holster that had a few little things that I wasn't completely happy with that they would never notice, care about, or be bothered by. And the customer really does deserve to get it sooner and get it at a lower price and not be made to pay for your little quirks about how you do your stuff. So get it shipped, get it out there. Um, Roger, you got any stories about stuff that you spent way, way, way too long on and kicked yourself after and said, I should, I should have just shipped it? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I just brought on a partner. Um, demand's so high that I can't take you it. You beat me, I don't have a partner yet. <laughs> uh, you also, well, this is full time for you. I wish this was full time for me. I don't have the balls to quit my job. <laughs> anyway, um, he, when he first started, he'd spend more than the time it would, for me, for an entire holster, just on the edge work. Hey, JT. I'm in Las Vegas at Cuvo Tactical. He makes sidecars. Nothing blew up. We aren't <laughs> killing each other. We make a wingman. Not a wingman. A wingman. Lucas, it's a wingman. Um, but yeah. I would laugh so hard if Lucas brought a product to market and called it like the wing car or the sideman <laughs> or something. Dude, Justin, I got some cool stuff to show you. Uh, what was it? There was something that happened, and I was like, oh, i got to show this to JT. I'll have to go through my photos and figure out what it was. The Polymer 80. Polymer 80 stuff. Yes! No, that was it. JT. Polymer 80 has a blank uh, polymer 80% Glock frame. Like, you just get it and stipple it. Check them out. They look really cool. I'm going to probably start picking some of those up. Uh, but, yeah, other than that, just working on the edge work. Uh, I mean, some guys uh, in the shop would end up spending the entire time that it would take them to make the holster just on the edge work alone. So... What Out of college, I did a year and a half of commercial painting and had a really kind, really friendly boss who was absolutely merciless about speed. It's commercial painting. We're in after the drywall guys and we got to get out like, <laughs> and so I'd be painting a section of wall and he would come up with another bucket, another roller of the same color, just cut in ahead of me and blow through the west, rest of my wall and be like, you have to go faster. And I'd be like, oh. And then I move out of the next wall, I'd go for a while, I'd start slowing down, I'd get real particular. He'd bring over the bucket, he'd cut in ahead of me, and blast through the rest of my wall. And he'd say, you have to go faster. Yep. And over and over, it's like, but it's not, like, it's not perfect. The sheen isn't perfect. I didn't get the same number of, like, it's not quite the way. And he's like, you have to go faster. I'm not paying you to be perfect, I'm paying you to be good enough. And that just blew my mind. I like that. He puts his toilet paper on backwards, says, Ahmad. Can we hear that up close? Get the microphone right over here. He's making that clicking sound with his tongue because that's foam press. No. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's a really clean holster. Yeah. And he's doing it with a blue gun and it works. Now, did you tape the blue gun at all to form it? Um, the blocking out stuff, yes, but we, you know, we're using DIY channel. So... But yep, we tape everything up. Hopefully not anymore once we start doing stuff with this guy. This thing is going to be huge. I'm going to switch the camera around real quick so I'm not selfie arm. So this kind of router has a big enough table area that he could very easily have an area for making his molds and then have more than one station for trimming his parts. 33 by 33 working space. Sweet. Now the real question is, how accurate, how, how much it will maintain the accuracy along those travels. So one of the things in CNC machining is where you set your work zero and then what your rate of error is and how far you go from it. So, you know, 1% of error in a one inch distance in our product makes no difference at all. But if he's zeroed over here and he's got a small error and moves all the way over here, it compounds and his stuff might be messed up over here. So that was why I know Conrad Miller a long time ago was talking about he had a four, I almost bought a four by four foot frame vacuum former. And I am so glad I didn't do it. I probably would be dead by now if I bought a four by four foot vacuum former. No matter how carefully I lay out my molds and put that all on my CNC table, if I had a four by foot CNC, I'm never going to be able to reliably position all those parts and get perfectly symmetrical clean cuts from one corner all the way across to the other corner of the thing. And I would be like, oh, I'm CNC trimming all of them. Why are they not the same? 
And so what I do on my machine, I do a pallet-based system and I machine everything in the same spot, basically right on top of my work zero. The pallet allows me to go fast. The small workspace allows me to be consistent. Errors are minimized. But on a machine this size, right now, dedicated space over here and dedicated space over here and not have to fuss around with an expensive pallet system. Also, a machine this size does not have a ton of available Z travel. So if you start putting down a plate and then a pallet and then your stuff, you start running out of room. My machine's got tons of Z travel, so an extra five inches of pallet and stuff is no big deal. So, for the guys that were asking, they were curious about the Shape Oko or the uh, what's the other one from um, X Carve? Yeah, stuff like this with the software they send. This took me ten minutes. This one initially took me about an hour. After I made this, this took me ten minutes from start to finish to make. So, now, those of you who have made mag carries on a split mold, what do you notice? What's not right about this? The spacing in the middle. The spacing in the middle. If you're playing around with spacing in the middle and you're either building your own or you're having somebody machine them for you or you're doing design, always start with the spacing wider than you think. You can always dial it in later. If it's overly wide, you'll end up with a little bit more spine on the carrier when you fold, but you'll have useful magazine carriers that function just fine. They can be demos, they can be testers, they can be personal gear because we all know holster makers have a lot of personal gear. A lot of personal gear. That's flawed. Aesthetically. I have a lot of blend personal <laughs> gear. I got drawers full of blend personal gear. I call every, them shot show freebies. <laughs> every time JT Garner comes over to my shop, I make him leave with some other piece of very slightly blend gear. And it's like, hey, JT, but on your way out, take an APL holster. On your, on your way out. Take... And he's like, why do you give me something? I'm like, I don't want it just sitting around. I'm not going to, I can only carry three holsters at a time. It's, anything more than that is just, it's just too much. So, I don't know, do you carry three at a time? Uh. <laughs> Depends, you just carry little mouse guns. One, two, three in front. So coming from New York, I'm big on the New York reload. Like I carry a 26 is my primary with a 34 is my New York reload. So yeah, only three says JT Garner. I pretty much run this every day. So tell me a little bit about this guy. I know a lot of guys have seen it. If they've paid any attention to your work or seen your website, what do you call it? What do you like about it? Uh, wingman appendix rig. I mean, you know, obviously everybody knows uh, Lucas came out with, well, I don't know if he came with the first one. I know we got a last line of defense made one too, but um, our Gen 1 was this about three years ago. Okay. No, uh, slight bend in the middle, single clip design, um, no canting in the mag. And it worked, but it printed. Um, this setup, we do a slight bend in the center, as you can see. Puts the mag up into the um, into the stomach, but it's off. It's uh, canted, easy access, adjustable retention for the mag. Four points for the gun itself because of the wing here. Nice, and, a lot of adjustability. I'm yeah. in recent times. I'm big on four points of adjustment. You can see this guy's got the old four points of adjustment. I'm a fan. But yeah, this is every day. Um, you train in it. You roll around in it. I drive every day in it. I don't have any issues. Carried appendix since when I was a cop doing plain clothes stuff, and yeah, but it's quick. It's nice. I tried that rig on myself earlier. I don't wear sidecar or wingman style holsters very often. It was pretty comfortable. It felt a little top heavy to me because I'm used to carrying a 17 with a 34 Ultra, and I'm used to just having a longer holster with more down by my leg for that feel of stability. And the ride height that Roger prefers on his personal rig is a little higher than what I like on mine. That's mostly a preference thing. Obviously, a full firing grip is, uh, you know, a critical concern. So I get that on mine too. But I like mine a little bit lower because I have such a big gut. And if you guys are playing with that, just put um, additional holes in your clips, and then let your customer play with it. But I try to eliminate as many options as possible. Learned that from some guys that are doing really well in the in the industry. What did you do to your options? I eliminated them eliminated them and the options are happier and more importantly your way happier yeah, we took about i think eight SKUs off of our website and probably two or three options per holster off and we've had no complaints we've had just more efficiency and just quicker turnaround times we went from 45 days to 14 days now customers don't really appreciate how much getting rid of the options that don't get used often really streamlines the whole thing. And if the customer can get the holster faster and can get the holster cheaper because you're not having to stock as many colors or as many fabrics or have as many different things on the wall, they benefit even though they don't realize it. You deliver a better thing 
better time, better cost to them. What else is out here? Uh, Dude, so what's with this big band slot that's way over there? Do you use it? Uh, that just was given to the shop, so... This I just was given to the shop? It was. Eric Powell, are your, are your envy, like, feelers prickling? This is a beautiful saw, man. Nice... Nice rockler table with a fence. The fence is included right down here. It's a grizzly. Man, you're gonna love this saw once you get it running. Yeah, all this stuff coming out. That way we can. He's throwing away a lot of this. The bike is definitely gone. Negative. <laughs> but now we started doing this distribution for Enforce and rubber dummies and stuff. So we'll stock a bunch of that over here and then have our whole shipping area and yeah, um, kind of run it like a full fledged shop. It's a work in progress, but every shop is a work in progress. So Roger, how many days a week are you actually out in here usually? Uh, so I work for local government, um, full-time job, nine to five, actually seven to four, but I'm in here at least, honestly, only one to two hours a day. Weekends, I'll crank out more, but um, my partner comes in, he does his share of the, of the shop, and you know, for one to two hours a day, uh, we crank out about 200 bucks extra a day, which lets me buy a lot of toys like Harley Davidson that I don't ever ride. Like I said, he's getting rid of it. Anyway, <laughs> make an offer. Um, we got some dinner plans, so we're gonna head out of here in a minute. We got some other people stopping by before we head out for hibachi. Uh, Conrad Miller's gonna join us and his wife Rachel and a few other people, which will be totally fun. I'm starving, I haven't eaten since breakfast, so I'm gonna go out and uh, one thing about some the, hibachi. One thing about the fabrics, guys, um, I originally started making the fabric because I wanted the Holster to match the gear identically to your multi cam bag or your printed bag. Continue. Um, that's why I got into it. I'm not a fan of the printed Kydex uh, multi cam and stuff. It doesn't match up to me. Um, and best, I was telling Henry or Andrew, um, had a customer send me a picture of a holster that he threw on his multi cam bag and it legit disappeared. All you could see was the grip of the gun, which is pretty awesome. And so a lot of customers have come to me that are wearing legit multi cam for picking doors down and stuff that wanted it set up that way. So that, that's why I started with the fabric. Um, now it's turned into, you don't need carbon fiber red with black cryptic or black multicam, but everything's it's just so damn cool, so. Michael and, Hallam asked, where do you get your fabric from? Uh, Rocky Internet. Woods, Rocky Woods. Rocky Woods is his source for cryptic fabric. For all the multicams, um, there's multi, like, multicam everything now, but there's multicam Alpine, which is this now. Um, and I use 500 denier. That's pretty much the standard for all of your gear and bags. Um, it's water repellent, and like water will just beat off it, which is nice. And um, a lot of guys like it. They say for sweat, being here in Vegas, I don't buy it, but yeah. Um, you Rocky love the heat, don't you? I don't. I love the winter, but the thing is, um, Vegas is everything's accessible 24 hours a day. Um, for the lifestyle I live, that's what I need. Cool. We're gonna. Pack up and head out to dinner. Thanks a lot, Roger, for having me in your shop. It's been a pleasure to be here. This is some cool stuff. I'm really excited to see what's going to come off this machine in the next six months, what other stuff he's going to make, and how his molds are going to turn out. Uh, shot Show has been a total blast this week. I got one more day to hustle around the shop. I ran into so many people today. I, I'm going to have to sit down tonight and go through my photos and, you know, get rid of all the fuzzy ones and post up all the ones that are cool. But lots and lots of neat stuff to show. I'm having a great time in Vegas. Um, as you can tell, I'm losing my voice. That's kind of put the kibosh on some of the Facebook live stuff I was trying to do because <laughs> in the mornings when I've been getting up, I sound like, I sound like death. So uh, it's hibachi time. Have a great night, guys. See you later.